the process in business development or recruiting a candidate or, or whatever it may be. And maybe we'll have some AI talk and we're gonna go to Ernie because Ernie was talking before you all joined. Go ahead, Ernie. I'm back. <laughs> well, should I go back and repeat what I said? First of all, what I wanted no, no, to no. say. No, no, You said you were going to say something. Oh, uh, yes. And then I, what I wanted to say is that HRTX by the uh, Recruiting Daily, they're offering a free conference. And that is scheduled for September 28th. And if you're not on that, you should, you should definitely uh, put your name on there just drop in or whatever you want to pay and to get some out they'll send you a, a recording but it's free and and these are the bad boys and the bad girls of sourcing and recruiting so anytime you get a chance to get a free conference you should check it out and and uh, I put the link here on the on on the um, on our message board so you can see it it's just look up recruiting daily good thank you yeah, this, um, but they, I think they did one last year. Oh, they, um, that they, I, did, they do it all the time. Yeah. Yeah. That I, um, that I, that I did the thing for. And there's a lot of different modules and whatnot mm -hmm. and what you can do. And, and, uh, it's not all relative to us, but there is some good stuff in there. And there, and there are times when I do that. And, and that's a, that the day I decide to paint the, paint one of the rooms and you just have it on and you're listening to it and you're painting. Or, or doing some work or going on working on the yard but you're just yeah. listening to what they're saying and and as long as you pick up one or two little things you know you're you're in good shape but but you understand what's going on in the industry and what's right. going to happen let, let me okay. let me ask of the, of the group here how many of you are finding yourself having to do business new business development right now because i know that's where i'm supposed to focusing most of my time yeah, me too. All right. Uh, that's that's why, and then and then, like, especially given last year, you didn't have to do it at all, and now this year, you know, you have to dust out the cobwebs and figure out how to get on the dance floor. You know, <laughs> and and that's that was it right there. It's a lot of people, even the ones like us that have done it for years and years, is dusting off the cobwebs, right? Like, like, like we forgot, you know, like what did we do, either even before you know, uh, the internet was a thing or email marketing was a thing. What did you do to get business? And that was what Ernie and I were talking about is, you know, as much as we want to automate everything and use AI and use email marketing campaigns and all this stuff, this is always going to be, and I will fight this. I will die on this hill. This is a phone based business. You have to be on the phone to develop the relationships. If you want any type of long-term client that's going to use you and look at you as a partner and not as a transaction so that that was what you know when ernie and i were talking about is like what do you do what do you do if you say okay look at what tiger does when he's failing he starts back to the basics what is the basics what is the foundation that we all learned to develop business and i think one of the biggest issues is people come into this business whether it's as a, as a new recruiter, right, in a really good uh, in market, uh, maybe I'll hire a hire guy who works for me and all he does is recruit and he's knocking it out of the park, right? He, every phone, he's calling people and we're getting interviews and he's making 20 grand a month or whatever it is. He thinks he's guys gift of recruiting, but he has no business development experience. And then when things get tough, he doesn't know what to do. He or she doesn't know what to do. And a lot of people were, weren't trained that way. You know, when this industry was booming the last few years. We didn't think about bringing on people to teach them business development. We talked about people to bring people on to help us fill our jobs. Is that, am I wrong? No, no you're, you're right. I think, I think a lot of times people, they get into this business and think, you know, I can make a few phone calls and I make a few placements and life goes on, but they don't realize how many phone calls you got to make to, uh, to get a job order. And uh, it takes a lot. And there's, and, and the real, and I guess I say this so that somebody who's even thinking of getting into this business will just have a, a, a way of saying, okay, that's how you do it. Or that's, and then understand that everybody does it differently. But that's why I figured you get some of you older guys like Tom and Tom. And, uh, <laughs> hey, I, I resemble that. 
I'm um, still uh, laughing, uh, Kelly. I don't, I don't no, that's funny, Alessio. You don't include myself in that, but you know. Uh, of course not. <laughs> okay, but let me bring up one other thing before we get into that. I was talking to Zach the other day, and and Zach was talking to me about interviews, and, and I'm, this is a compliment to Zach, and it's one of those things that you, you kind of learn by talking to the youngers. Uh, he he, uh, we were talking, and he was talking about these team, these team interviews that they do, team meetings, and and he knew how the interview went. He didn't participate, but when they did the team meeting, they included him. And he said, I just listen in. And I, and I asked him if I could listen in. And, and he's there as a silent, a silent person sitting on the, in the room. And, and I'm thinking, hell, I'm always included in these team meetings. But I figure I'm not allowed, I'm not allowed to, to be in them. But yet at the same time, I don't ask. And if I could just ask, and then I'd get a better idea of what they're looking for. Just a small little piece that, like, one of those things that we talked for about half an hour or so, right, Zach? And and uh, and I'm, that's the one thing I said, damn, I got to do that. <laughs> that's a good point. I, I you know, I, I get in, invited sometimes, too, and that's actually not a bad idea that you could just sit, turn off your camera, just sit as a silent, turn off your mic and just listen see what your client asks and see how the candidate responds. But I always feel like I would be doing this every time the candidate spoke in some situation. So <laughs> that would worry me. But no, I mean, that actually is not a bad idea because it might give you a much better insight to when you're interviewing candidates. Because that's one of the things that I pride myself on is I could interview candidates and realize not only do they fit uh, qualifications wise and experience wise, but they fit culturally into my client. Like what? they answer things and act a certain way that I know my client will be excited about. And I don't have to, I won't make them say the things that are important, but when I hear them say the things that are important to my client, I know I have a good candidate. Well, that makes sense. Well, Tom, the other part though is Zach is also evaluating how they're conducting their interviews. Yeah. And he's looking and he's looking at, are they selling the company appropriately? Are they do how do they oh, come across? How do they come across? And and he's like, you know, that was our conversation was how do they come across and how do how do you then coach them? And that's what he wanted to do. And I thought, you know what, damn, that's that yeah. I, learned, I learned a lot. <laughs> so thank you. You Zach. could tell your client, hey, well, after that interview with Kelly Nelson, um, you guys didn't sell your company at all. You didn't bring up your zero layoff policy, your benefits, your profits, whatever it is. Why? Are you That's sounding... actually a really good point. I never mm -hmm. thought of that. It's That's a because good point. everyone is afraid of me. Well, so, <laughs> you well, when, you don't show your, when you don't show your face, how can we not be afraid of you? I was sneezing. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that, that, that was a good, you know, that was a good lesson for me to t when I talked to him and I, I thank him for calling me. But also the third point of that is this. We're in this meeting together. We're like we're like a, a a family, and anyone who joins us is a family. And we know that I've gotten phone calls from you. I've made phone calls to different ones of you, and and that's what you do when you're in this group. You, it's not just this meeting. It's like Dale spent a half an hour on the phone with me the other day, and he's got fucking COVID. Who's no. that? Oh, really? Dale. Uh, I'm got COVID geez. and spent a half an hour actually on Google Meet helping me because I'm trying to. The, the, the last conversation we had about the SEO and the, the oh. all that. So I, I'm paying a guy to actually add a career page that, that automatically uploads the job from Loxo. So I was asking him questions about, about that and like how to do the thing. And he's, he was on COVID, sent me a Google Meet link. We start, And I'm like, dude, you, and he's, it came in. He's like, what's on a mask? No, you can't be in here. Go talk to mommy. Oh. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing talking to me for? Yeah. <laughs> so but I think that's the Canadian side of him though. But I mean that. So there, there are many advantages to just. It's not just a having questions answered here. It's a relationship building, and it's also, yeah. like, you know, it's, it's it's a big plus. So, thank you. To to the transition to what Ernie was saying, and the fear, right? So, I try to explain to people this business we fail ninety percent of the time, or ninety five percent of the time. In the very beginning, ninety nine percent of the time, right? So. 
early on, my very, and I, I, you've probably heard me tell this story, Mike Benavenga was a roofing estimator who lived in Chicago, Illinois, that wanted to move to Phoenix, Arizona. And I, that was my MPC, a frigging 26-year-old roofing estimator who wanted to move from Chicago to Phoenix. And I called hundreds of roofing contractors in the state of Arizona, started in Phoenix and worked my way out, um, you know, with a stupid MPC pitch, but it was failure over and over. It was 50 phone calls a day, you know, trying to market this guy. I was a bartender. I'd never sold anything in my life but drinks. And I failed constantly. I was in draw. I wasn't making placements. I wasn't getting clients, but I didn't stop. I didn't allow the fear of the phone, the fear of failing or any of that to stop me. I just kept pushing forward because I, as I've used this before, fail our way first, right? Do what we do, or, or and, and when I say do, is when I worked for a management recruiter's office, they had a process, a process that worked, right? They had a training program that worked. If you did what they said they did to, to do, you would you would succeed in spite of yourself, right? And that's all I did. So that's why I try to instill in people here is like, if you're going to do this job, you got to do it. You can't half-ass it. You can't think you can do it part-time. You can't think, oh, well, I made 100 phone calls and didn't get anybody. This is not a good industry or this isn't a good cat or whatever it is. It's just no one's going to just accept you and say, oh, Ernie Moreno, I've never talked to you before. You have zero experience. In, you're a bartender. Now you want to help me fill my position. Oh, yeah, here. I'll give you a job order. Right? It's, you it's, have to really love it, though. You know, if you're going back to Ernie's first comment about what Brian Fink said about people who have been internal and why don't they want to develop business and stuff like that. I mean, you got to really love, you want, have to want to do yeah. this. This has to be in your blood yeah. in order to do that. And if, and if it is, See, then that, you don't care about making phone calls or doing, you like it, you know, it's maybe not every day, but it's not that big of a deal to you. And so my point is, if you're, if it's that difficult, you know, and that's not the way you want to spend your day, it's probably not the job you should be doing. But I'll add to that, that's, that's half of it. The other half is also where you don't want to go back to. You know, mm -hmm. you, you could say, you know, I'll do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to try it. But, you know, like for me, it was like going back into HR. And that was what I didn't want to do anymore. And so I'm going to do this. I'm going to keep doing this. But uh, my my the other thing the other the other thing I could, the other thing I I could do is HR. <laughs> but I just hated the thought of it. And I kept thinking, what else am I going to do? And you know, my singing ability wasn't up to par. <laughs> if I have a really good MPC, I mean, like a guy I know, companies want. I love marketing that person like i get excited if i have like a guy that's like you know five years experience living in dallas let's say and like i'll go work for any company that does this or whatever and i know that people are willing to pay a fee for this guy oh my god i love marketing a really good mpc because it opens up doors and you could be a cocky bastard because you got the goods that's <laughs> what makes this job fun when you have the goods and, and, and again, you know, this is kind of funny, though, because we're talking about we have to business development. It doesn't matter. Some markets, if you have goods or not, people can't pay fees. They don't have an opening. So I get that one. But on the business development marketing side, if I have a good candidate, I love marketing. I tell, I tell people they got to be that guy when you were in high school that would come and hit you up for 50 cents or a quarter. And you know they weren't going to pay you back. But they always hit you up and they hit up everybody. And then every once in a while you hear the story and you give him 50 cents and then your buddies will say, hey, you know, he's not going to pay you back. And then you go, yeah, I know. But, you know, it was a good story. I liked it. There was Ernie, like, Ernie's aged himself like 50 cents is a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was going to say it was, a, it, was a, it was a quarter back then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can go to the movies on that. <laughs> yeah, but, and, and, by, and, by, and by snacks. But uh but you know the whole thing so, was it, it was just it was just that personality, and that was your first exposure to an actual salesperson in person to you. Well, that's a good point. That is a good point. He would sell you on giving him money. That's actually not a bad point at all. So, so 
Ernie, do you, we, we had talked about this before. Do you guys want to like? I'll, I'll, I'm just, more than happy to share like my process, whether it's how I go about doing a job order or how I go about doing an MPC. What, um, what I want you to do up. is tell us. Okay, you got, you got the job order. Okay, and and mm -hmm. that. So what do you do then to collect your candidates? Okay, to do that so, and show us the process. I, I sat down with. Uh, um, Exxon and Exxon tells me uh, we need an engineer in Houston who's got gas and pipeline experience. They need to have their PE and um, they will relocate somebody in when we refer not to, and they have to have at least five years experience in designing oil and gas pipelines, right? So that's kind of, you know, the search I might have. So the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna put it in LOXO or your applicant tracking system or whatever it is, right? You're gonna put all the pertinent information so you have a way to, to a place to put your candidates, right? And a place to put the candidates in through a workflow right whether it's you know short list long list i call them i email them whatever it is and then how are you going to get your candidates right so that's the next question so for me it's sales navigator the next thing i do every single time is i go right to sales navigator and i start punching in the filters i'm going to use to get to the person so obviously it's going to be find out where their office is and they're in houston but what part of houston right so they are you know uh, 21229 or whatever Houston zip code is. So I'll use Navigator's thing and I'll do a 30 minute or 30 mile radius. If it's a place like California, you can't do 30 miles because that's a four hour commute. So you want to, you know, think about, you know, the commute time for that. And then I do that. So that's the first thing you do. And then you start narrowing it down. And then you want to look at when you're narrowing it down, using the filters to your advantage. So it could be, is it title? Is it industry is it years of experience is it um keywords so for example for one of these searches i'm probably going to put in engineer design engineer structural engineer civil engineer project engineer project managers titles and the cool thing with you know you can do all those titles so or 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 and then maybe in the industry side i'll do oil and gas and then in the keyword thing i may put in you know pipeline design or pipeline and then see what type of results that bring up. And then you start narrowing the searches down if it's too many people. If it's not enough people, then you take away words. But what you're trying to do for any search, in my opinion, is get somewhere in the realm of 50 to 100 candidates. And then once you've done that, you add them to your lead list and then you really look at the candidates and say, okay, are these good candidates? Narrow that list down. Now I get a leads list of 70 people, let's say. Then I'm going to use sales QL, or you can use whatever thing you do to extract the candidates from the leads list. So it could be um, you use sales QL, and what it'll do, it'll grab all the phone numbers and emails that are available, right? And then you go to sales QL, and then download that as a CSV file, and I put that into Loxo. So now I have my or my applicant tracking system. Now I sit down on my applicant tracking system, and there we go. I have. 63 candidates. I have all the phone numbers and email addresses on them. Now I have to go to town. And this is where a lot of people like don't, where do they start? Okay, I'm going to send emails to everybody. And then I'm going to send a contact uh, LinkedIn connection to everybody. No, get on the phone, right? In this market, you get a good job order, get on the phone and talk to those candidates. You can send emails to all the people who live two, within 200 miles away, right? Because you don't want to try and convince someone to relocate for this job. You don't want to have to overcome objections when someone says, well, I'm divorced. And if I want to see my kids, I got to live close to them. You can't overcome that objection. So those aren't people you're going to, you know, try to overcome objections to. But if you are calling people, let's say, within a 20 mile radius or 30 mile radius of your, your job and you hear, I'm happy, I'm, I'm happy where I'm at. I'm not looking to make a change. I'm not, you can rebut that. You can overcome that objection because it's local, because it's right there. And their only reason they're telling you that, just like the same reason you come into a car dealership and say, I'm just looking, right? It's just a way to get you off the phone. And that's where your, the, the, your, your skills as a sales rep, a salesperson, and your skills as a recruiter are best used on that group of people that are, the best for your job in a market where you don't have to relocate them and you can use rebuttals to overcome objections and then use LinkedIn if for whatever reason they're not interested and well, let's connect on LinkedIn if anything happens. Uh, and then if you want to use an email marketing, anybody you didn't get a hold of, you can add to that email marketing. You can also then extend your search out 
Let's, let's, let's be realistic with the email marketing. You can get three, 400 connections to people with your emails or whatever. But really, in my opinion, when I'm doing a search, I want to do, I want to call everybody that's in that 20 mile radius first, get them on the phone, get excited about it, sell the sizzle about my great opportunity, overcome any objections of I'm not looking, I'm happy where I'm at, et cetera. And then evaluate at that point, oh my gosh, everybody's telling me to go pound sand. There's an issue with money. Is there an issue with the client or whatever it is? But 99% of the time, we get candidates. Not, I mean, 99.9% .9 of the time, when we do the search that way, we have two, three, four candidates that we can either send in or after I interview them a little more in depth, realize they're not good or they can go elsewhere. But that's how we fill our searches. We have, I have not filled a search by a mass email or a mass LinkedIn or anything like that. Every, almost every search I've filled has either been someone calls me up and say, hey, Tommy, you talked to you three years ago and I'm ready to make a move, or it's somebody we recruited in this exact process. Okay. So then how do you go about getting the job order? So I have, I have nothing right now on my table. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. I'm just starting. I need to get clients. Well, you need a good MPC, right? Is is is, and you can make up one. There's a lot of people who talk about making up an MPC, but it's a little more difficult because let, let's be realistic. Even if you have a really good MPC, and I get excited about a good MPC, but I know my market well, what are the chances that you're going to call a company up and have a guy or gal that fits their job perfectly, and they're going to pay a fee for? It's very very rare. Well. Right? It can happen. It happens. It can, I know. I said it's rare. But, but it's, it's just idea, to open the conversation. Exactly. It, the idea is to open the conversation up. And then, so when someone says, well, send me your resume, you know, you, your next response should be, do you have an opening for a person like this? Not okay. It, it is just, you know, starting the conversation. Oh, well, may, uh, you don't have an opening, but you want to see a resume? Well, what do you have an opening for? And you're trying to move that, that and this, that's a whole, this is, that's a big conversation we can have. But the idea of the MPC marketing is, yeah, it's great if you can place that guy. If I could have placed Mike Benavenga, it would have been awesome. But the idea was I'm on the phone with these people, letting them know I'm a headhunter who works in their industry. And I'm trying to use my selling skills to transition from, hey, do you want to interview Mike Benavenga to, Hey, what openings do you have that you can't fill? Can we fill them for you? And, and, and that's where the oh, wait, real quick, Ernie, that's where so many people get lost because it's it's mind-numbingly boring and frustrating because when you're starting out, you're talking about hundreds of phone calls and people telling you to go pound sand. That's or worse. <laughs> let's let's go back a little bit deeper, a little bit further back. I'm brand new. Okay. I'm brand new. I have no, all I know is I want to be a recruiter. Today's day one. Okay. No what idea. industry do you want to be in? I don't. I don't know. But tell me how to do that. Tell me what. Where. What. What do I do? What. Ge what geography do I hit? What. Where. Where. Where does it all? So, start? so you know, there's. You have to have some type of. I want to say connection, but at least something that'll excite you if, if you've never done this before and you're going to become a recruiter. And I know for me, if I had started this without the company I worked for, I probably would have went into wine, right? I love wine. I love alcohol. I was in the restaurant business, right? So I could have transitioned that. Don't laugh. <laughs> I could have transitioned that into recruiting, right? I could have said, okay, I'm going to become a recruiter and I'm going to be the guy who finds, you know, people for the wine industry or people for the purveyors or people for restaurants, people for bar. I mean, there's recruiters that do everything, right? So uh -huh. you have to determine what that, that, um, get a niche, that field you want to go in. Once you do that, then we go back to Navigator, right? So we decide, okay, I'm going to be the guy who places, uh, 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 uh guys who, who wine, uh, uh, what are they called? The guys who make wine, winemakers, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get winemakers, right? So I'm gonna call every, every winery, vineyard, winery in California, in Oregon, in Portland, whatever it is. So you're gonna have to go to Navigator and then work your way through that, right? So you're gonna put in, you know, um, and, and again, I'm sorry, I don't know the industry, but um, there's there's the industry for food and beverage or whatever it is, and you're gonna do, use do California. It with, do it with construction. And say you're going in. Okay, so, you, so if you're going to go in construction, you, 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 you know, 
that's that's more simple. Let's say, okay, so you can say, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna be the guy who places superintendents in South Florida, in Florida, and for general contractors, right? I, I, I my dad was a superintendent. His dad was a superintendent. I know about superintendents. So you're gonna go into um, Sales Navigator. You are going to put in the parameters. Right? You're gonna put in construction as the industry. The title is going to be whoever reports to a, su a superintendent. So that could be director of operations. That could be senior project managers. That could be owner, president, partner, whatever it is, right? You've got to do a little research on your end to figure out who hires superintendents in Florida in the construction market. And that's going to be a pretty big list. So to narrow that list down, you're going to do stuff like commercial construction, or let's say subcontracting. I'm going to do it for roofing contractors, but am I going to do commercial? I'm going to do commercial roofing contractors. So you're going to have to narrow that down, deciding on where you want to be. It, it, because your candidate, right, your superintendent who's working for a general contractor is going to have most value going to work for another general contractor. If your superintendent happens to work for a commercial roofing company, he's going to have more value for a commercial roofing company. So you kind of got to think about it like that and then go into Sales Navigator and let's do commercial roofing, for example. And we're going to put in, you know, um, the titles of director of operations, general manager, uh, owner partner, president, vice president, and then commercial roofing contractors and bring up that list. And it's that same thing. Now you're going to use sales QL to extract all those names of all those hiring managers. Once you've done that, then, and, and my app on tracking system doesn't have a good way to do this, but you're going to want to put them in some type of list that you can work off of. So you can, now you have your candidate and now you have your list of 250 um, directors of operations, presidents, owners, et cetera, in Florida that do commercial roofing. And now you have your candidate and you're going to go to town. Hi, my name's Tom Alaccio. You and I have never spoken before. I know you're busy with your brief. I'm a headhunter who specializes in the commercial roofing field. I just interviewed a superintendent who works for a company that does EPDM built up and modified bitumen. He's been a superintendent for seven years. He was former for nine years. He's, he's handled his money as three crews and he's looking to make a job change. Would you have an interest in talking to him or something like that? I mean, I'm doing this from off the cuff, but that's it. And then he's going to say, we don't have an opening for a superintendent right now, or eh, maybe, and then, and then you start rolling. What are you, are you looking for in this market? I know it's tough right now in construction in Florida. What are you looking for? Well, we really need an estimator. Oh, well, we do estimators too. How long have you had the position open for the estimator? Now you've completely got rid of the superintendent and now you're talking about an estimating position. And that's how your marketing call should go over and over and over. Just like that. You're marketing that person to a company that could be willing to hire them, but probably needs something else. And if that doesn't work for you, then there's my assumptive opening, right? And I tell it in a, in a candidate driven market, if you want to get job, you want to come into a market, you know, where there's a lot of a relatively a lot of openings. It's that, Hey, hi, my name's Tom Alashi. I know you're busy. You, I'll be brief. We just got done doing a search for XYZ commercial construction in Orlando, looking for a superintendent for them. And we heard you guys were actually looking for a superintendent. Reason for my call is to see if A, you filled that position. And if you haven't, um, to see if we can be of assistance since we were able to help XYZ Corporation. At that point, he's either going to say, yeah, we do have a, a superintendent. Thanks for calling. Let's talk about it. Or no, we don't. Go pound stand. Or no, we don't. And you can say, well, maybe the, my recruiter got it wrong. Are you looking for somebody in, in, the, in your roofing division? Well, yes, we are. We're actually looking for a foreman, right? So, so however you do it, it's getting in front of that hiring manager and either presenting a candidate to him, presenting a situation to him, and establishing that relationship. And again, this is not going to work after five calls or 10 calls or 20. It, it may take you 50, 100, 200, 300, especially if you're new, because you're going to stumble over your words. You're going to screw up. You're not going to know how to overcome objections. I've been doing this 26 years, so I this stuff comes natural to me. But when I started, I was an idiot. First of all, I talked too fast and I talked like this and nobody could understand the thing I was saying. But I got the message on the machine and they would call back and they would say, hey, come for him. some guy from call from your company and he sounded really excited, but we have no idea what he said. He just, we got his phone number and we think his name is Tom, right? So that's how crazy I was when I started out. My boss came to my office and he wrote real big, slow down on my whiteboard. <laughs> because I was, I talked like, I mean, I was like, hey, how you doing? My name's Tom Lachey. How you doing? Like, that's just who I am. So I had to learn to slow down and that helped. Did and you, then, do you have that? Sorry to interrupt. Do you have yeah. that? Your pitch that you just made, do you have it written into a script? 
that you could share? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I just, that just pulled out of my ass. But yeah, well, I, I know, but I will, yeah, I will have it. It, it. When I was early on, I actually had a script, right? It was like, hi, my name is Tom Alasio. You and I have never spoken. I'm like, I had a script, right? And my boss told, taught me how to sell sizzle, right? So we often feature, feature, feature. It's feature and benefit. If you're writing a good script for, I don't care if it's for a, a job opening, a marketing call, whatever it is, you have every feature needs to be a benefit, right? Features are fine. I have engineering degree, seven years experience designing buildings. Okay, all my people, what benefit is that to me? Which means he can come on board and hit the ground running because he works on all the same projects as you. Or if he's a sales guy, he can hit, he can open doors that you previously didn't have access to because of the because of the clients he works with are not your clients, but they're selling the same products. So he's selling widgets to all the people in that you want to get your foot in the door with. And he if he comes work for you, you now have a whole new bunch of clients. That's a benefit, right? That's not a feature. That's a benefit to the company. I can make you more money because I can bring my clients over or I can hit the ground running and won't need to be trained because I know everything there is about commercial roofing as a superintendent. I've worked on modified bitumen. I've worked on uh, built up. I've worked on uh, torch down. So any, any roofing systems you guys have, I know how to manage a team for that. That's a benefit to the features of your candidate. So when you're writing a pitch, you have to make sure you have that to entice the employer and, and kind of get him to think, oh, yeah, he is a superintendent. But man, he knows all those uh, <clears throat> roofing systems. We've had a real tough time because we don't have anybody who knows modified bit or we don't have know anybody who knows metal or whatever it may be. So it's when you're writing that pitch, think about that feature and then what benefit that is. It's the same thing we talk about with candidates, right? Uh, what is it in it for me, right? Like, oh, uh, more money, no commute, uh, work from home, right? The same thing with an employer. What does this candidate have that's going to benefit me versus telling me about his resume? You're reading off a resume. He's got his bachelor's degree, his, you know, seven years experience in commercial roofing. Talk about the benefits that may, you know, you're not going to know, but at least it's beyond just features. And that's what's going to get a client to go, well, shit, this guy knows what he's talking about, too. When you start rattling off that you know about EPDM, modified bit, torch down, et cetera, you're not just some recruiter shoveling resumes, resumes around. You actually know a little bit about the industry. That's why I like the assumptive opening, because you're coming off as, I just filled a position with your competitor in your market and heard you had an opening. So immediately that employer's thinking, oh, this guy is working in my market with one of my competitors and he just filled a position that we're trying to fill. I should probably talk to him versus that the hundreds of emails they get every day from recruiters who, you know, call me Thomas or, or send them to my, my dog because he's on my website or yeah. instead of looking at my company, the thing says, would PR search in Inc PR search Inc have an interest in our client? Like, dude, you're using a software to pull, the middle of the domain out thinking that's my company's name like that's the kind of shit that people are doing and kelly showed the, the emails before there's some shit that's going out there so the, as the more shit that goes out there the more that your clients are not going to look at it even if you have good stuff because you're going to you're going to be in that that whole uh area with everybody else and they're not going to have the time to uh, weed through it but if you call them on the phone and present a opportunity with a candidate who's got you can hit the ground running as immediate benefit. I really think someone said today, as more A and I gets on there and more people start trying to automate everything, guys like us are going to do so much better because we're going to stand out. That okay. all of a sudden, one only one recruiter in in the roofing industry is calling people anymore, and that's Tom. Tom. Tom B. Yeah. Do you, do you agree? What? Give me your give me your take. I, I agree a lot with what Tom just said. I, I have a similar approach um, in that I do I do rely on Sales Navigator a lot. Getting back to your initial question about you know determining who your ideal client is, your ideal prospect is. Once you have identified who that is, and you can use Sales Navigator, like Tom said, to pin it down and decide, determine who the companies are, who the decision makers are, and then you can get the emails and phone numbers. But beyond that, I would also do a couple other steps. And 
for example, I would, if I'm also looking for trying to get jobs for new business development, I would go out on LinkedIn, just a plain old LinkedIn, run a search for jobs for whatever it is that you're looking for, construction managers in Dallas, Texas, and then save it as an alert. So it sends emails to your inbox for those job leads. Do the same thing on Google, set up Google alerts. Um, uh, so that is driving potential job jobs to you. Getting back to the sales navigator thing. Oh, Tom, real quick. Thing, on yeah, Google yeah. alerts. On the Google alerts. Another thing I do is people you want to do work with clients put just their name in there because you'll get like when they get a new project, when they're opening up a new branch, a new look, anything that happens in the world. In the, in the news, you'll get an alert on them. So you may find out so-and-so got promoted and it gives you a chance to say, hey, I heard you're now the vice president and he used to be an engineer you placed there. So when that's you, a good thing with Google Alerts. When you, when you say put their names, do you put their personal names or do you put the company names? I, the company, I'll put like um, uh, uh, next level executive search in quotes. So it just, if something comes up with next level executive search, any, any news article, I'll get an alert for it. Or um, if I want to work in uh, uh, commercial roofing, I may do something where I'll put commercial and roofing and project. Okay. In case it's released about okay. that project. I okay. get it from I get it from my LinkedIn Sales Navigator account because I save the companies and then it'll let me know, you know this news item or this people is going that move. On. Yeah. People that moved all up. But beyond that, what I would also do, and I think I mentioned this previously. I also follow the companies on LinkedIn and I go in and I follow the, the hiring managers on LinkedIn. This way, when they post something, I'll know that they That's post something and I can see, oh, John Doe is hiring a construction manager in Dallas, Texas. All right. I'll know that right away. Or I'll see John Doe is was just recently in the news about blah, 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 because he attended a conference. So I'll reach out to John Doe. I'll like it. I'll comment on it and I'll reach out to them directly. Um, this way you're staying, I don't want to say top of mind with them, but you're, you're, at least you're, you're following them. You're showing interest and you're, you know, you're, you're keeping your name out there so, so that, you know, they're constantly seeing you without you bombarding with them. You know, Hey, you so want to buy a chicken? You want to buy a chicken? You want to buy a chicken? So Tom, so Tom, Tom, when you're that's the way I learned this business 30 something years ago. Anyway, <laughs> go ahead. So so Tom, you 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 follow the person, yeah, you like them, you comment on, you know, hey, congratulations or whatever. And then you said you call them. Do you call each and every one of them? I mean, you know, for the I, general I may not call them, I may just send them an email. Uh-huh. Okay. okay, but you you connect, you you communicated separate from LinkedIn. Right, because they, yes, I do only because they're an, if it's if it's important to yeah. them, okay. If if you know because they may not go back and look at it on LinkedIn, they may not look at the comment that I may have made. Some of them do, and they'll go, "Hey, thanks," or they'll like it. Um, but I want to stand out, so what I'll do then is I'll send them an email or I'll shoot them a quick email or whatever, because more than likely we're connected on LinkedIn. Okay, and if you don't know them at all. I still do it. I still do it. So what has been one of your successes in doing that? I haven't had too many successes yet because it's a new process. I'm, it's a new process I'm doing. Okay. And, yeah. and, well, talk, talk about that, new processes. How does what, what goes through your mind when you do that? What, what are your thoughts? Uh, it's very time consuming, but I look at, you know, it's it's a long haul. Mm -hmm. And and if I can get somebody first of all to respond to me, I look at that as a as a small win. If I get them to connect with me on LinkedIn, that's a small win, because to me they're an ideal client prospect. I've targeted them for a spe specific reason, and the way I look at it is if I get them on the phone, which in my business my industry is very difficult to do in IT because a lot of times they don't answer the phone. Mm -hmm. All right. But when I do, do get them on the phone, I look at it three ways. I can either help them by solving a problem that they have right now, a gap that they have on their team. Okay. Or I can help them by potentially improving their career. 
all right? And if not, at least I can provide some information and some hopefully some value to them about what the competitor's doing or what other things are going on in their industry or technology that they're working with that I'm familiar with that I can share something with. So it's not just, hey, do you have a job? Let me, let me fill it. Or I'm the greatest thing since sliced bread because everybody's saying that. In their phone calls, their emails, their emails, everybody's saying how great they are, you know? And, and hiring managers don't want to hear that. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Now, what about the issue of a process? I always use the word process, but I mean, it's kind of like habit. You know, you, you, you get up, you take a shower, you go, you go into the bathroom, you brush your teeth, you comb your hair. Which, <laughs> yeah, there you go. You That's a good it. one. That's a good one, Zach. Um, <laughs> so that I, begin, Zach. I didn't see it. If I have uh, a job, if I have a, a book, Atomic Habits, and I'm reading right now. <laughs> yeah. If I, uh, I like his um, his YouTube videos. I haven't read the book, but I like his YouTube videos. I have what a was process. The name of the book? Atomic oh, Habits. Atomic, Atomic Habits. Habits. It's oh yeah, really okay, good. yeah. I've heard of that one. It's well known. Yeah, he's he's real good. He's a real good speaker. Um, if I have a job lead, Ernie, I. Uh -huh. throw them into lock, I throw them in the lock so it was a deal. I have a link to the job that I found, whether it's on Indeed or wherever I found it. So I note it. And then I find through Sales Navigator, I find who the contact, the hiring managers are. I put them all into a deal and then I follow the process there. I will reach out to them by email. I'll reach out to them in mail. I reach out to them on the phone. I'll create a task right in the deal to follow up with them. Okay. Yeah. Do you do you create the task within your your database? No, I created it within the deal, which then ties into the person's record, uh -huh. the deal, and it shows up on my Outlook calendar because I have it all synced with my Outlook calendar. So um, any given day, I can have 20, 30 follow-ups that I have to do. Okay, okay. Okay. Yeah, no, no, that, and that's what what I like about you guys is is even getting into the details of how do I do it because one could say, well, you you look up people. Well, how how do you look it up? You do this, you do a task. How do I do the task? And how they're all connected, and and everybody does a process that's that works for them, and then and then how many people do you have to do it for? But I think what I'm hearing from you guys is doesn't matter how many make sure it's a lot because it ain't going to happen like with one or two phone calls and if you get discouraged with one or two phone calls then uh you need to get over that yeah another, that another thing i just started doing and maybe you guys already do it but within my sales navigator account i have companies that i have saved in there that i'm targeting okay and each day i'll go in there and I'll take a look at new people that have been hired within the last three months because that's what it defaults to. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'll look at it. And sometimes there, there are people that are not even within my industry, IT and cybersecurity. So I'll overlook those. But let's say I see John Doe started last month at Amazon as a cybersecurity executive. He doesn't know me. I don't know him. So what I'll do is I'll get him in my Loxo database. So I have him. Right. I'll use SalesQL or some other tool or Loxo Connect to find their contact information. I will then go out and I have a um, email campaign, outreach campaign set up for new hire. I have it called new hiring managers. So I put in there, once I have him in my Loxo database, I have the fields auto populate for you know, the, the, the template, congratulations on your position at blah, 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 as blah, 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 at XYZ company, you know, you know, wishing you the best. If I can ever be of help, please let me know. Here's my contact information. I don't try to sell anything. I'm just making a brief intro and congratulating them. And then I have it set up in a campaign. If they don't follow up, I have it pushed out now for another three weeks because I don't want to bombard them. They just, they just started recently. My second campaign message would be, you know, I reached out to you. I haven't heard from you. It's been two months since you started your position at XYZ. Have you had a chance to assess your staff? 
Are there any gaps, any areas that I could possibly help you with? So I have it set up in a campaign for new hiring managers at my company prospects. I have another one that I set up for promotions, people that are working for that company, but they just got promoted. I have a separate email that does that. So um, is have I made a placement off of it yet? No, but it's something I just started a, about five weeks ago. Um, Tom, can I can I ask uh, what is a tactic or strategy that you've done that has uh, landed you a job order? Zach, to be honest with you, I I muscle our recruitment manager, so I manage a team of recruiters. I'm helping out on business development. I just started doing this about six weeks ago, so I ran a full Gosh. desk for many many years. So I am going back to. The basics, as Tom said, and I'm focusing a lot of my time right now on new business development. Um, I'm getting the, hey, great to connect. I love your, you know, love your profile. Don't have any openings right now, but or we're not looking to change up our vendor list or anything like that. So I'll follow up with them. But no, I have not landed anything yet. So, so let me ask you, yeah. talking, talking about vendor list. Yes. Is there, is there a time of the year? that i you, asked them i asked them you know when what are you going to evaluate your vendor list and what what is your what is your decision criteria okay because you want to know what is i don't ask them what their decision making is what's the criteria they're looking for what's important to them from a vendor perspective um and you know sometimes you'll get that from them or they'll say you know hey thanks we're I've had a couple say to me, look, we have too many right now. We're going to whittle them down. We're not going to add anybody. I just said, okay, you know, if things ever change, let me know. And by the way, here's my areas of expertise. If you, if your vendors are not able to provide qualified candidates for any critical searches, let me know. And Who are you talking to, Tom? But that says we're not looking to do our vendor evaluation or we're not changing vendors. Usually it's, I, I start with the hiring managers, the decision makers themselves, and sometimes I get pushed off to HR, okay? So or, is, procurement, is way, or procurement, or procurement. Is there any way to like keep that, like to me, the changing vendors thing, like that's always going to be a tough one because you got HR, TA, whoever it is that kind of manages that list or procurement, but the hiring managers are one feeling the pain. How do you kind of bridge that to make sure that hiring manager like, is that who you stay in contact with every three to four months because that's the guy i want to yes. see like hey yes. you're, you're obviously whoever's running your your vendor list is a fucking idiot um let us fill a position for you you know and get us on that after we yeah. fill that position or something like that do you no, say absolutely do you, you tell gotta stay in touch with them. Yeah, yeah. No, i will <laughs> just depends <laughs> on the client is. when you work construction you can say that <laughs> Anyway, go ahead, Tom. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, that that's uh, yeah. I definitely want to. I definitely stay in touch with the hiring manager because ultimately they're the ones that are making the decision, not not TA. Okay. Yeah. Um, Never take no from a person. Exactly, yes. and things and things change all the time. I may have mm -hmm. an NPC like Tom said at some point that, uh, and when I have the hiring manager on the phone, I'll ask them, "Look, you know, I I can understand you got a process right now. You got a vendor list, but let me ask you this." <clears throat> what's the most crucial critical position you have a, your vendors have a difficult time filling and they may say uh or i'll say are they always a hundred percent are they always delivering a hundred percent most of the time people are going to say no they don't they don't deliver a hundred percent okay so what are they lacking what is the one position that you typically when you do have an opening for this what is it and how long does it typically take for your vendors to fill it? You know, now they may not have an opening, but now I know this is a critical need for them. So I'll keep that. So when a, you I'll see that, that pop up in my mind, yeah, when that pops up or you get a good candidate to fix that, you can call and say, look, I know I'm not on your vendor list, but I got a front end developer with 10 years experience in hospitality, who knows C plus plus and X and sharp. Do you want to talk to them? So we, we've had success on contract positions where we weren't on the vendor list for the company, but we were able to bring the person in because we had the right person on a statement of work. Okay, so we did an SOW and we were able to place the person, bypass that entire vendor 
process. That is, that's what I was talking about because that is what's going to get you past the whole, you're not on our vendor list bullshit. When you actually, and we talked about that before, when you have the goods, when you got the fucking goods, the hiring manager will move heaven and earth to get that candidate in, regardless if you're on the vendor list or your fee is too high or you don't know the president or whatever it is. So, so you're starting out, you're, 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 you're a recruiting firm. How many clients do you need? Oh God, I would say at least prospects or you know clients for one thing prospects you, you, you from a company perspective you probably need to have at least 20 or more signed agreements oh signed well, that, agreements at least you want to get there no no yeah. i'm talking about i'm yeah. talking about okay you got to go and you you pick up a you pick up a company that's your client because you've signed the agreement and they're going to use you you know and and people are saying talk to 100 how many do i need how many job orders do i need to keep me healthy if your average fee is twenty thousand dollars and you want to make, and you're on your own and you want to make two hundred grand a year, you need to make two deals a month, two hundred forty grand, forty thousand dollars in expenses. That's that'll, you know, that's a very very rough estimate, mm -hmm. right? But so so what I have is I have one client who is good every year, no matter how bad the year is, for at least a hundred grand in billings every year. Sometimes two and three hundred, right? But I even the worst economy in 2008 i did 100 grand with them okay they're always good for 100 grand and then i have four or five clients that give me like one search a year sometimes two right and then i got clients that'll give me a search every three years and then i got my mpc i heard about a job order kind of not even clients just that i've, I've placed guys with because someone said hey one of our vendors does X, Y, Z. Do you have an engineer that fits with them? Yeah, and then I'll place a guy with them. I won't really call him a client because it's a onesie, like a onesie twosie, right? So that's, I think in my, in, you know, for my world, I have that, that mix, right? So I can always rely on knowing as long as I take care of that one good client, I can pay my mortgage and I won't have to eat cat food, right? And then the rest of the clients are the ones that, you know, the icings on the cake that allow me to drive the car I drive and go on vacation and do all this stuff I do, right? So that's kind of how I, I look at it. As long as I keep, you know, my my biggest client is, is the most important thing. And then everybody else, try to keep them happy when I can and then go out and get new business when I lose one. Tommy, in the same way, what, what's your thoughts? Me, yeah, it's similar. Um, I... If you if you're just starting out new, first of all, you 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 know you don't know what you don't know. But yeah, um, you definitely need if you're working contingency, you you you've got to have multiple job orders that you can work on at one time. And if you're a solo operator, you got to be able to manage your time. And then there, you're going to take a look at where do you feel you can have your most success. And it's Closest not just money. It's not just the highest fee. Okay, it could be. The relationship that you have with that person so far and are they reactive to you are they responding to you when you're submitting candidates are they responding to you and giving you some guidance as to when you submit a candidate are they giving you good constructive feedback or are they just completely going silent with crickets and if that's the case you're probably one of several others that are working on that same job and they don't care whether you feel it or somebody else feels it and you know that's the way this business is unfortunately but um, I would say you've got to have what you can handle. And if it's five job orders open at one time or three job orders, I find that most recruiters, if they're focusing exclusively on candidate development and recruiting for jobs, they're probably, depending on their experience, they could probably handle two or three job orders at one time, maybe more if it's high volume type jobs. Um, but I think if so, you give them any more than that, I think they get too, too distracted. Your, your ADHD kicks in. Yeah. Two things I, we focused on early on, like when I it was a, a send out a day, right? So you want to get one new first time send out, right? So that's a phone. Usually it's going to be a phone interview for most of us, right? So a send out a day, and then your day is split in four things, right? So eight o'clock in the morning, you come in, you have a morning meeting with your boss, you hit, you hit the desk at nine. You return emails, you look at phone messages, and then 9.30, you get on the phone, 
and then you're pounding the phones. Let's say in the morning is business development. You're doing nothing but marketing a candidate, uh, something opening, whatever it is. You're out there pounding the phone, trying to get clients. And then at 11, 30, 12, you stop, check emails, check phone messages, go to lunch, kick the cat, get back in the office at 1, 1 1.30, check your voicemails, check your emails. Boom, you're back on the phone. Now you're recruiting, right? You've got job orders. Now you're recruiting and you're recruiting on each job order. And back in the day when we're working contingency, you, you haven't got any engagement fees. It's you get one candidate and then you mark and then you, you you're working on a job for a, a estimator in Chicago for roofing and you get an estimator who's interested. You stop on that job and then you either go present that candidate to that client or you go and you keep you switch to another, you know, because you have your plan. You switch to another one and so on. And then at four o'clock, you stop. You check voicemails and you plan for the next day, okay, right? So right. you have to plan. Four to five every day is planning. What are you going to do the next day? And early on, it was marketing in the morning, recruiting in the afternoon once you had clients. And then getting that first time send out, right? So you're working on those job orders. You get that candidate. You call the client up. You do a POJO, presentation on existing job order. Got you an estimator. He interviews them. Now you got your send out, right? You got your Monday send out or your Tuesday send out. Boom, you're back on the phone. You're marketing. And then it's that it's that thing like he told two friends, he told two friends, right? So so you're working on a job and you're looking for a roofing estimator in Chicago and you get three good candidates. They're only going to hire one. Now you got two MPCs. So your plan for the next week or whatever is you're going to market the best of those two estimators into Chicago roofing market, right? And then let's say one of your other jobs is a superintendent in Florida and you get three superintendents. You're only going to place one. Now you got two superintendents you can market through Florida. Right. And you keep rinse and repeat. Right. Your desk is kind of like a manufacturing plant. You got to bring in candidates. You got to bring in job orders. Right. And then you got to create deals. So if you're not finding job orders and you're not recruiting more than one candidate for your job, so you have MPCs that you can market back through, then what are you doing? Because usually that's how you build your desk. You know, when I started out, I worked on any job anybody gave me. I worked on a landscaping job. My first placement was for a paint a coding and painting sales guy for a commercial division of Sherwin Williams in San Francisco for $20,000 in 1990, December, 1997, my first place. That's when I got my fee in. I've never done a single painting coding position since, right? I, I you know, so I was working on crazy jobs, but I had candidates to market and, and that's how I stumbled onto the steel industry. So go ahead, Ernie. Alan, do you have anything to say? You're laughing. <laughs> <At us. laughs> you're, 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 I know, I know, I know. You know your, as they say in the old world. I know you know your shit. <laughs> you know you've been around. And I love being told when I'm wrong. <laughs> you do not. I do so. <laughs> Kelly, don't let so you know Alan, you're Alan, wrong. <laughs> Alan, you've been quiet. What do you got to say? I can't hear you. You got to put your microphone on. I think he's the construct. He's a construction guy. <laughs> Alan I forgot is? about him. I, yeah, Alan is a TA in a construction company. Oh, me, me being me being quiet is a dangerous thing. Um, <laughs> I think it's I think everything that's being said is pretty accurate. Um, I think that I I think you know Tom's Tom's comments and do I okay? Do I refer to Tom as Tom as Tommy as Tommy? I, I don't want to be no, call me Tommy so we know who you're Tommy, talking Tommy about. Tommy Tom. Tommy Tom. Okay, so Tommy, Tommy was talking about this. No, um, the um, no, it, it really is, and you know, it's it's also very industry dependent. I mean, like you know, Tom was talking about you know how many you're talking about how many clients. Well, if you're in high tech and you're geographical and you're local, then you could handle more because you're handling very specific things. Also, to Tommy's point, it's that's the case too. But if Tommy, if if Tommy and Palermo are handling you know, national construction, um, it's it's a little different, but you are talking about the MPCs. The other thing about construction, and, and I'll make the argument for other industries is, and Tom made, made a very good comment, it's about the long game. It really is. And because, because construction, I mean, look, you guys were mentioning about the vendor list, okay? We're a pain in the neck. We're hard to deal with here. And mm -hmm. We, you know, and I used to do, when I had my agency, I ran into the agency, I ran into the vendor list problem. And I, and I learned pretty quick that you can call BS on it a lot of the times. But what we did here is we actually went through a very formal process. We evaluated 25, we in-person eight, and we made commitments to three. 
and there's SLAs and there's and I got called by a guy yesterday and he's trying to he's some other guy he's trying to do the you know okay well so if we find a perfect person should we not I'm like look and we're like I said we're weird and we're rare because <laughs> because my my response was let me put it to you this way if if you if you brought me some if you were one of the three that went through this process and then you found out that Robbie's recruiting company placed Steve Smith through the back door or through the side, how would that make you feel? And, and, they, and, and a professional is going to say, upset. I'm like, exactly. So we have to honor our commitments. And if we on, and if we if we say we're going to do something, we have to do it. But you need to build relationships. Again, it's about relationships. And to Tom's point in tech and and other things it's about tech it's about the long game it's about being authentic it's being genuine it's about knowing your market it's about being able to speak to it i'm sure tommy and palermo can do that and you're in cpg right there ernie yeah food in food industry okay. so when i was at nestle i could talk about hershey i could talk about unilever i could talk about and i and it wasn't that i was saying that they were garbage it's okay well unilever's benefits are x Unilever's value is X. Hershey's value is Y. And here's why we're That's dead on. <laughs> um, and it's not about it's it's for the candidates. You need to be able to speak to that um, with for the clients. You need to be able to give them the comfort that you understand their market. When I'm dealing when I'm dealing with these three, if I if I call something out to one of these three agencies, two of them. If I get a hold of Tommy a lot, a lot. Oh God, man, I'm gonna butcher. It. <laughs> hold on, hold on. I'm, I'm Italian. Hold on, I can do this. Alash no, you can't. Alashio. There, like pistachio, Alashio, like pistachio. Oh, sure. Yeah. So, so if I'm dealing with Tommy and with Zach, and I hire Ernie, both of them are gonna call me at some point and go, "How the hell did you get a hold of Ernie? I know Ernie. I've known Ernie for." But that's how well these. These agencies know the market. They know the economics of the market. And so when I was in when I was in high tech, I did a lot of work in Orange County, California. And I did a lot of work with Toshiba and with Canon and with others. And I'll never forget, I was done with Canon for the day. I drove around to another parking lot. I'm doing my phone calls, just sitting on a bench. And these two guys are complaining. And I'm like, wait a minute. These guys sound like software testers. A lot of stuff. Yeah. And, then it, and, and, like, and I'm like, guys, I'm really sorry, but I, I, I just, I, my name's Alan. This is what, what do you guys do? I'm just curious. And they were software testers. And I'm like, where do you guys work? Well, cool right here, a little three story red brick building. I got, there's no signage. I'm like, what is that? Oh, it's Virgin Interactive. And I'm like, oh, okay. Well, what do you guys do? Gaming. And we all talk for a living. But sh I've got a note on my monitor says, shut the up. And like, what do you guys do? And how do you do it? And how do you like it there? They hated it. They absolutely hated it. So over the next four or five months, I got five software testers to literally take a new job two blocks away. <laughs> and then they started referring their friends. That's awesome. And, you know, it's just, I'm, I, I love, I, Look, we all like people. I'm very curious about what people do. I love learning all the stuff I don't know. And I find it fascinating to deal with a subcontractor or, a, or an estimator or somebody else and hear what they're doing. And when, when I get called or I get forwarded an email from an agency, I look it up. I do research. I do. I don't throw them all away. I want to know, do they handle our market? Do they do this? Do I want to put them on the list? Should we decide to revisit the vendors next year. I don't know. Nine out of 10, I don't because they're fake. Here, here's, a, here's one for you guys. How many of you have run into competitors that are in the UK? Okay. Not really significant, but yeah. Okay. They have been coming in droves. Okay, hold on, hold on. I can't mention names here, but I will tell you there are two groups of Oh God, how to say this. Okay, I'm gonna use an old example. Has anybody ever heard of Stride and Associates? No. Real quick, uh, 
guys, I'm going to end it. I got a, something I got to do. So I, real, real quick, I, not, not our meeting, but I'm going to end the recording. Uh, we're going to end the recording right now. But thank you all for coming to the recording. It will be up on our YouTube channel. Uh, if you have any questions, read out to any of us. If you Google our names, we'll be there. But we're just going to stop the streaming because we don't want to talk to you anymore. As ah. usual, smile and dial. Have a great weekend. And remember, the phone is your friend. Okay, go ahead.